our version of a farm would be different. Plants, wildlife, livestock, all working together. Here they are, Emma the pig and Mr. Greasy the rooster. Friends for life. <laughs> we wanted to believe that everything had a purpose. I really enjoyed like my work as like a wildlife, um, you know, filmmaker. Um, so for me, I was always sort of connected to that part um, that I think obviously relates to what we did with the farm ultimately. But I think it was really like Molly's foray into being a traditional foods chef and understanding that, you know, food really, the health of the food, the flavor of food really starts with the soil and the farmer. And kind of always had this idea that maybe one day we'd do, we'd do something like that. Yeah, and I guess I would say that um, I learned the, that you're truly not in control. I mean, that one for like type A, German, yeah. Molly, that was hard. <laughs> and you're not in control and that it really is about flow and guiding and uh, intention. What about your son? Like, what would you hope he um, learns through the process? I hope our son, you know, continues to have an appreciation for the work that it actually takes to grow really healthy food. Because I think that there's multiple generations of a disconnect between what, you know, the value of food with nutrient density and deep flavor, and, and how that just sort of informs the health of the overall ecosystem. And working the fields and being there. I mean, it looked like you guys were really involved with every kind of step in the documentary. It shows that. So. Yeah. I mean, we. We had to go through everything before we could pass it to anybody else. We didn't know what we were doing, so yeah. Yeah. you have to do it. Yeah. What are you guys hoping for the future? Like, is the farm working in the cyclical way that you kind of hoped it would? Or Yeah, I, I, the, we've gotten to a place where we're not reacting too quickly to problems. And there's so much stress and energy that is taken away from your life when you feel like you're in this constant state of panic to keep up. And I, and I think we both would agree that, like, um, the trick now is to actually really set back and allow the embarrassment feeling that you normally feel that motivates you to try to fix it too quickly. Allow that to, to sort of settle in and accept it. Accept that you don't know what you're doing, but if you sort of stare at, at it long enough, you know, you're going to find a solution that has a, a much more, you know, sustainable result. Yeah, for sure. Okay, the drought is over, am I right? It's over for now. Yeah. Yeah. It's great though. <laughs> is that something that keeps you up though? Like the potential of being in this area where there could be... I think we're going to be increasingly facing, you know, water restrictions. Okay. In, you know, uh, municipal water use and agricultural water use. And I really think that it's, you know, it's our job as farmers to, to think about that and anticipate that. I mean, they've already reduced our water allowance by 25%. You know, and so we have to yeah. anticipate that that may continue to happen. Um, but the most important thing is we're growing cover crops and cover crops keep water from leaving the farm and it puts it back in the soil and that recharges aquifers. Yeah. So essentially we are recharging a natural dam that exists beneath this soil. And that's the way I think farmers in this area should really be thinking. How did you pick this area? Park. We, Southern California. I think when you're, when you're trying to start a farm, I think you also have to look at like if your goal is to, is to sell food to a local food economy, then you need to be within a proximity that's close to an area that could support it. I mean, the problem and the challenge is most farms are two, three hours away from a million yeah. people, you know, okay. but this, we're within 40 minutes of, you know, 12 million. And so we knew we wanted to be somewhere that a local food movement could be supportive to the way we grow so much more alive. John, please be careful. You know, my great-grandfather named a community just out of appreciation and respect for his friends and neighbors. This coffee is made with four generations of family care and, you know, it's not just one family's business, it's a lot of families' business. Our expectations are the same. It's that rich, smooth flavor. We guarantee you love in every cup.